Impeachment can be fun. Welcome to This Week in Common Sense for the third week of December 2019. Here's Paul Jacob. That was sort of our theme this week, you know, because we had three commentaries uh, about impeachment, sort of, touching on impeachment, and and uh, there was some lightheartedness, well, maybe in two out of three. Uh, you know, the the first one that comes to mind, it was the one that was um, arguably the, the least lighthearted. I heard Trump talk about the Chinese trade deal and basically say, do us a favor. You know, apparently this guy, I mean, I know this will shock everyone. Apparently this guy says stuff like, uh, you know, somebody's terrific and then they're a bum the next second. And he says things like, do me a favor, do me a favor or do us a favor. So, uh, but he asked him to buy agriculture. And there was a, uh, you know, some commentary about it that, uh, hey, this is, uh, this is Trump uh, doing a deal with China that's going to help hit one of his main voting blocks, farmers and rural folks. And, uh, uh, of course, if you, you know, are president of the United States, the timing of different things right before an election, as far away as possible from an election, if it's not such a good thing. Uh, these are very important. You know, we know as uh, Friday night uh, befalls us that uh, there was a, you know, a rush to do something about impeachment because this is an ongoing problem and we'll get to more about that in a moment. Uh, but there was a rush to do it for that reason. And yet uh, now uh, Nancy Pelosi is holding on to the impeachment articles and not transferring them over to the Senate and trying to play some, some game there. And Constitution doesn't say specifically uh, you know, how fast she has to turn them over. But of course, it belies the whole argument about why they had to move quickly. Um, and it just seems like shock of all shocks everything is politics uh, to these folks. And, and when I say everything is politics to these folks, you know, that sounds like, a, yeah, these rotten old politicians, they're real people. They're not rotten old politicians. They're people just like you or me and other people we meet every day. They have a different incentive structure, a much different incentive structure. And I am submitting that when it comes to war and peace, and whether your or my child is blown to smithereens, it's all about politics for them. There's not a more damning indictment you can make against folks. Uh, at least it's hard to, hard to imagine one, and I don't want to try. So often in, po in, in commentary and in politics and so on, we, we talk hyperbolically, we say things more than they are. I know not the president, but others of us. Uh, and, uh, and yet, sometimes it's pretty doggone serious. And, and I'm jumping all over the place here because I'm just going on this rant, but th that's part of what I think when I hear people talk about Hong Kong or the, well, the, you know, they've destroyed a bunch of property in Hong Kong or they've done this or that. You know, it's just so obvious that what we're talking about is whether people are going to live as just slaves in a totalitarian society and and you know maybe if they if they salute hard enough and obey every rule they won't be beaten up and killed and can find some happiness uh you know the the whole if if you're involved in politics and you're not concerned about people being free and being able to live lives that matter to them to do it their way you know you're part of the problem and, um, and so, you know, it, it, so often we don't, I think, as, as much as we're hyperbolic, we don't realize we're talking about real people's lives. Um, you know, when we talk about drone strike policy about the United States, real people that you and I have never met are being blown to smithereens. Um, you know, when it, on all of these things, um, it just seems to me that, uh, we, we ignore some of the biggest problems while we hyperventilate about other stuff. And I'll, I'll, uh, I, think, I think my rant ran its course, but 
this commentary, uh, what I pointed out was there is, you know, every opportunity to, you know, say what Trump was trying to do was evil uh, with this call, uh, just in, and to say what he's trying to do with, uh, with the trade deal with China is evil. Maybe it is. Maybe he's only doing it to help himself. Maybe the call with uh, the Ukrainian president was simply because he wanted to get Biden. He wanted a headline. And, and that would be an abuse of power, of course. The problem is that that hasn't really been shown. And you could have a more generous uh, view of it. And, and the, the problem here is not realizing that we need everything, all these uh, abuses of power and the enormous power that we keep seeing that the president has in foreign policy, setting tariffs, economic policy, the ability to declare an emergency and move money over here to build a wall or to do anything else. You know, if Trump might want to build a wall, somebody else might want to build something else. Um, all this power that the president has, and we hear, you know, primal screams, oh my God, look what Trump's doing. But almost never do we have any follow-up that says, we're going to change these rules. We're going to do something about it. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, instead we go through this impeachment thing that, uh, that wasn't done very seriously in terms of, of really investigating. If you look at past impeachments and, and, you know, we've tried, I've tried to stay out of the weeds of all of this because I, I don't think you and I and, and the world, you know, the average citizen in the United States can do much about it. Um, but it, it does just appear to be a, a ongoing partisan, partisan uh, witch hunt. Doesn't mean that, you know, Trump used that as a defense. It doesn't mean he's innocent. Uh, it just means that that they're not playing the way that that uh, that I think honest citizens who have no dog in the fight would say makes sense uh, in terms of, of the way this whole thing has taken place. One of the good things about impeachment, though, and having fun with it, although it wasn't all fun, is that we get comments from people. And uh, we get comments other times, but it seems like we had more comments this week than, uh, than maybe usually, and, and some thoughtful stuff. I made the point, um, you know, uh, in this piece about, you know, it didn't seem like uh, they really had much to, to go on against uh, President Trump, uh, or at least alluded to, you know, that they had overblown things. Uh, Thomas Knapp comes in and says, well, you know, Trump violated a treaty we have with Ukraine, and he violated it in three different ways and so on. Um, and again, it, it, you know, I, I don't know about the folks out there in, in uh, internet land, but I never heard anything about a treaty that had been violated. And of course, John Brennan comes in, another regular uh, uh, listener and reader and and uh, uh, part of the of the program and and he says uh, wait a second this is you know this is trying to make a mountain out of a molehill in in essence um, and and then as kind of a parting shot says it's amazing that the Bidens haven't asked for an investigation to clear their name and and of course uh, th there are people who've made allegations against Joe Biden as vice president that somehow this was part of some plot. I don't know that those have any real credibility. I think where there's credibility on the whole Biden, Burisma, Ukraine thing is that there just doesn't seem to be any good economic reason for Burisma to pay $50,000 a month for the services of Hunter Biden. And, um, and that question doesn't get answered. And in fact, in much of the media doesn't get asked. And, uh, you know, I, I think about a lot of Americans, I sort of figure that, that uh, you know, uh, all these sons and daughters and, and wives and husbands of powerful folks uh, who are getting all these plum jobs. I mean, this, is, this isn't the first time this has happened. This happens all the time as a matter of course. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, I think we all look at it and kind of say, 
yeah, this is probably an insider plum. They wanted to get in good with uh, Biden. Who knows who later might have said, hey, I'm the nice guy who gave Hunter a job or, or any number of other things. You know, NBC sure gave uh, Chelsea Clinton a heck of a sweetheart deal to become a, a on-air personality and to do some things. And it's, you know, a lot of money, no track record of having done much. You know, it's a free country. They're free to do those things, but they look like payoffs to people. And, um, and you know, that's a problem. And it, it, it's even more of a problem. Uh, and this is just an aside, one of the comments, but it, it really is more of a problem that the media doesn't seem to be that interested. And again, it's because, you know, if, we, if they write a story about, the, about Hunter Biden and whether he was justified to have this job, all of a sudden they're, they're doing Trump's work or they're, you know, so, it, you know, if, if it not only is our politics partisanized, not only is, is uh, are we seeing partisanism in our daily lives in ways that a lot of us don't like at all, uh, but our media is, is very partisan and, and feeds into it. You know, the, uh, the other uh, uh, statement we had um, about impeachment was impeachment day 2020. And it, it did sort of seem like, you know, that, that it was, hey, it's time for impeachment. Here's the, I mean, it was such a dog and, and pony show, kind of a, a, a parody of a, an impeachment. And of course, we talked about Scott Adams, who has uh, been awfully sharp in, uh, in analyzing politics, one of the early people to predict that Trump was gonna get elected. Uh, and to predict it because Trump was communicating in a way that was very effective and that Hillary Clinton was not communicating in a way that was effective. And anyway, he looked at, at what Adam Schiff came out and, and Adam Schiff comes out and says, hey, he's continuing to cause problems and that's why he has to be impeached. Uh, the fact that Rudy Giuliani was in Ukraine, that, uh, you know, the... Trump is still president and must be trying to conspire with foreign governments to, to uh, you know, steal the election. And it's, you know, here you, you have not only the, you know, the craziness of always being, you know, hyperbolic and, and having a tissy fit about everything that goes on and it's all existential threats to democracy and so on, but, um, but it's a pre-crime. It's that we have to impeach him, not for what he's done, but for what he might be doing right now. Uh, and it kind of shows a pretty weak case. Um, and, and when you, you, know, you, you walk through it, and, and frankly, um, you know, in reading parts of the Mueller report and looking at different things and reading the news, I'm not at all happy with the way uh, Trump conducts business from what I can see. I'd, I'd like to see, I, I wouldn't mind more investigations of different things. Uh, you know, this call could have been looked at in, in maybe a much deeper way. I'm not sure that's really uh, would have been fruitful. I'm just saying that, that this is not to say, hey, Trump is innocent. He's never done anything. He's doing everything perfectly. You know, it was a perfect call, as Trump would say. Um, but, but, you know, I can, I can laugh at Trump saying stuff like that. And I can... Um, you know, I can, I can look at this and, and realize they have wanted to impeach because of what happened in, in, you know, the 2016 election. Well, they, you know, they had an opportunity. They had a whole report, you know, and, and it didn't come to, hey, there was collusion. Uh, it didn't come to there was conspiracy to violate the law. And, and of course, in, in one of the comments on this week on, on the impeachment front, Billy came up and said, hey, uh, there were 272 contacts between Russia and the Trump campaign. And they didn't report to the FBI or to whoever. Well, one, I don't know that that's true, but I don't dispute it at all because I'm sure there were lots of different contacts. I mean, some of them were at meetings at a, at public meetings and so on. So, um, you know, it's not as if anyone's saying, oh, that, that was a contact where they did something nefarious. They, they didn't. And in essence, we've had the report. That's not what this impeachment is about. You can't say, gee, I think that guy was guilty two years ago, 
of robbery. So now that he's on trial for murder, even though I don't think there's the evidence that he committed murder, I'm going to find him guilty because I think he did something else. And, and so we can't just, you know, we can't just fill in the blank. Well, there's got to be a reason. He's a bad guy. There's an election next November. And the really sad thing, if you don't like Donald Trump, is that most of the country doesn't like Donald Trump. Donald Trump has had over a majority of the country who view him negatively. In every poll I've seen for, since before he ran for president, to his election, to his inauguration, to every day between now and then. And, and so this guy is, he's not popular. If he wins re-election, he wins re-election because the public is less afraid of him than they are the alternative. And that's the ugly fact that's out there. And that, that you know, there's more and more, you know, you, you see Bloomberg get into the race so late, this is unheard of. And yet it's because there's that sense out there that there's not, there's not much, you know, that, that, that the folks out there and the Democratic Party moving, lurching to the left uh, is, is really problematic. And of course, we didn't write about it, but uh, something you and I have discussed is that, is that uh, you know, this is what happened in England with the conservatives, you know, really cleaning up and uh, the Labor Party just being decimated. Uh, that's a big deal. And it was largely... Uh, the same sort of makeup in terms of the election uh, that people felt labor had gone too far to the left. And in essence, we're going to get Brexit. And uh, it, it sure looks like, and the, in essence, the voters voted again for Brexit, although there was clearly a huge chunk of folks who voted for the conservatives and for Brexit who weren't comfortable with Brexit, but they were so uncomfortable with labor that they decided that's the way to go. And I think we could see the same thing uh, next November. And I think, uh, I think Democrats who are savvy uh, have to be very, very worried. Isn't there the question of the media? To what extent do people dislike Trump because the media is always being anti-Trump? And I mean, most of it is anti-Trump. And then to what extent is the pro-Trump because they see the media as as just absolutely lying or being partisan itself. So there's another element besides just the Democratic Party. Right. No, it's a great question because, of course, both of them are, are partly true. I don't, think, I don't think Trump's negatives are because the media beat up on him. Um, I think he's come off from day one as kind of he, he, he played up as a playboy. He purposely was trying to get stuff in the paper as him as a big playboy. He, he tried to develop an image for business purposes and I, for whatever other narcissistic purposes, you know, people are people. Um, and anybody who runs for office is pretty much a narcissist. Um, but, but anyway, I'm just, you know, I'm painting with too broad a brush, but, but, uh, but I'm not wrong. Anyway, uh, but he, he built that sort of image that wasn't designed to be everybody's lovey-dovey teddy bear that was designed to be a, a uh, you know, he travels with the rich and famous and he always gets the girl and he's the dashing playboy billionaire entrepreneur. That's not how to be Mr. Popular to everybody. And so he started out not very popular. Um, but he did, you know, I think the, the way the media has played it uh, has cemented him. One of the things that bothered me about Trump in 2016 is that he was seen by so many people I knew uh, and discussed things with as an outsider. And I did not see him as an outsider. I see him as a guy who's writing checks to politicians who got deals to, to, for eminent domain, to build big things, all kinds of, always wheeling and dealing with politicians. I didn't see him as any sort of outsider. I see him as more of an outsider today. I can't help it. The entire media, with the exception of kind of Fox News and a newspaper here or there, you know, over the, the next hill, uh, you know, and, and talk radio, with the exception of that, all the media is on 24-7, you know, uh, Trump derangement syndrome. And, 
And I remember during the campaign, I never really considered myself a never Trumper. Uh, not that I voted for him or was planning to vote for him or was considering voting for him, but, but that I didn't see him as somehow so terrible that never Trump, you know, anybody in the world would be better. Um, but I was, I was very, very concerned about, you know, Trump as the Trump Clinton. I mean, my goodness, how does, how do you, how do you have a worse, you know, as, as uh, David Bowes that uh, Cato said something along the lines of, you know, someone asked him, uh, you know, if a person put a gun to your head and, and uh, said Hillary Clinton or, or Donald Trump, what does a libertarian respond? You know, how does a libertarian respond? And he said, uh, pull the trigger. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of how I felt. And reading the Washington Post every morning, as I do, um, I just the only, I, I just felt sympathetic for Trump. I, I saw them so over the top on things that I thought this is this isn't this isn't fair reporting, and um, and it's just you know I I think like a lot of people you tend to go for the underdog you know when you see somebody a bunch of people piling on somebody you kind of think wait a second let's you know let's have some sense of of perspective and what what has he really done or said and and uh, and I and I think especially with politicians. You can always hear about, oh, they said this and they think this, but you got to look at what they do because the rest of it is a lot of smoke and mirrors. And, uh, and so anyway, I, I do think that, that for a lot of Republicans, Trump's battle with the media uh, has created much more of a connection uh, and a bond with them. And the fact that he doesn't always kind of back down to the New York Times and the Washington Post and doesn't play kind of the same game that other Republicans have, they love. Uh, and and uh, I don't know if I, I love, I, you know, I, I wouldn't always say things the way he says them and so on, uh, but I do find uh, my own ability to criticize the media. I think the media has been terrible in terms of, I think they would have done more damage to Trump uh, had, they, had they covered him more honestly, instead of uh, what I think is a very partisan. And the only reason I say it's dishonest is because they pretend not to be partisan and they're covering him in a very partisan manner. And they just owned up to it and said, look, we're, we're, we're pro-Democrat, that's where our philosophy is. We see him as a bad guy for that reason, fine. Um, but. Anyway, I, I think you're right that the, the other thing is that the media is playing a role today that, and let's face it, they've always been powerful, but, but they're just playing what I think people across the spectrum are seeing as a much more, we're on this side or we're on the other side type role. And, um, and you know, that's, I think it's changing the way people see the media. It's not just that the media is against Trump, They've also sort of been complicit in the Hillary Clinton plan, which was revealed in WikiLeaks, to encourage the media to cover Trump more than he would have been naturally when he started his campaign. Hillary Clinton's campaign thought that he was an easy mark. You know, the media that played along was, in a sense, complicit in a scheme that back backfired. And that's made them crazy. Trump derangement syndrome is not just about Trump. It's partly about guilt or something like that. Well, I, I think you're right. Uh, I, I think that's right on. And in fact, if you remember our, because you were up at, at four in the morning and it was three hours earlier your time, but you were up editing the piece that I wrote on election night uh, or in the wee hours of the next day morning uh, about the election and basically concluded with the media lost the election. The media lost. And, and I think that they, they did in that sense. And, and I think also, uh, I think one of the most interesting comments that was made, I don't know what, what talking head program it was made on, but Larry Sabato, who's well-known political science uh, professor at University of Virginia, uh, and um, you know, is often a commentator and so on. He was asked whether the media is treating Trump unfairly. And he basically laughed and said, of course, but they treated the last Republican candidate unfairly and the one before that and the one before that. And what, what is true about the media is 
they have their own opinions. And when it comes to the national media, I remember a poll that was released, uh, taken of, of the Washington Press Corps when Clinton was elected in 1992. Over 90% voted for Clinton. Over 90% of the press corps in Washington voted for Clinton. They're now covering. Do they think that what George Bush or some Republican says is right? If Clinton's saying, no, that's not right. Well, they've kind of already said. And, and look, everybody's going to have an opinion. But you either, you either check that in some real way or you own up to it. And, and it's not just Democrat over Republican when it came to pro-life, uh, pro-choice issues overwhelmingly 90 percent plus you know pro-choice so is you know maybe that's why they changed those terms to be pro-abortion rights and anti-abortion rights um you know language matters and and uh, uh look at the gun issue i mean for years when when democrats wouldn't touch the issue the media continued to push for the need to to do something to restrict our Second Amendment rights. And, um, you know, I'm not objecting that they don't have the right to say what they want to say. They do. But I think they're saying it in a fraudulent way when they don't own up to the philosophy that they're pushing. And I think that it's right for us to warn other people, look, when you're listening to basically the mainstream media, ABC, NBC, CBS, you know, their cable affiliates, CNN, the New York Times, Washington Post, Associated Press, um, they have a, a liberal bias. And, and when I say that, I think that the national press corps is to the left of the Democratic Party. Not, they're not, oh, they're over closer to the Democrats. No, 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 no. They are pulling the Democrats further to the left. So it is, uh, it, it's, I think it's important to recognize there's one complication there with the pulling to the left. The media left seems to be very interested in war and the deep state. They seem to be very much on board with whatever the CIA says. They seem to easily buy into stuff. And that was covered in your Wednesday column, Between the Devil and the Deep State. See? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and I'm, I have, I'm going to give you credit here in front of everyone that that wonderful title was your title. Uh, that was another one. I think I had like eight different titles for it. And I, I told you, none of them are any good, though. And this was, uh, this was a good one, a keeper. Uh, lots of fun. And, but, but, you know, part of what we're talking about there is, is the other story that is breaking, but is not getting a whole lot of coverage. And that is the IG report uh, on the FBI and Michael Horowitz coming out and and they want to run with the, well, Horowitz said there was a legitimate purpose for the original investigation. Um, in essence, saying that the category they put it under, if those things happen, then that's a legitimate, you know, category of, of activity to be investigating as a potential crime. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, some people had said, oh, you know, it was all, a, you know, even, even going in was ridiculous and so on. So maybe it gave them some cover. The real takeaway, if what you're trying to do is not to beat someone so you win the next election and so in the news cycle you said X and Y and they said Z and you win because people say, well, I guess they didn't do anything. If you actually read the report and look at what's really happened, we had the FBI again and again with not low-level people, but crack teams put together and under high-level supervision. Lie. Lie by changing items that they gave a secret court. So it's bad enough for those of us who believe in civil liberties. It's horrifying enough that we have secret courts in our country. If you're going to have a secret court and part of the idea is that you fully tell them everything, now we have found that the FBI lies to them. And here's one of the lies. And this is, this is how consequential the lie was. This is the one that looks like they may prosecute uh, the, the gentleman for, the FBI agent. 
Carter Page was an informant for the CIA. They reported that Carter Page had no role with the CIA or any other organization and so on. So this wasn't that, oh, we made a mistake. This was not reporting the information you know to be true, which would have changed the whole nature of it. If the CIA, in, in effect, has used this guy as a source, then that changes a little bit the whole way they're painting it. This is serious, serious stuff. And this wasn't the only mistake, mistake, error, crime that, that may have been committed. This is very important stuff. And again, it seems like there's not the sort of interest that you would expect the media. Oh my goodness, this was secret. Now we find out about it and it's a terrible thing. They violated people's rights and so on, but we're not gonna hear it that way. And we're not gonna hear it that way because of Trump maybe, I don't know. Is this, is this just Trump derangement? So anything that an intelligence agency says, we now have to believe just verbatim, don't even question it. Whatever the CIA says, whatever the FBI says is true, no matter what. Is that what the media thinks is the, you know, the dominant media thinks is the way we ought to approach these things? It appears to be, but I'm hoping it's just because they've gone crazy over Donald Trump. Uh, because on a long-term basis, a media that views you as a traitor, if you ever question the national security state, is not a media that's that Thomas Jefferson or other people who said, hey, uh, given a choice between a free government and a free press, I take a free press. Well, I wonder if he still, we may have to resume the body and find out if he still thinks that, you know, when we, when we cure all, all of his ills. <laughs> we had two non-impeachment scripts this week. Yes, uh, you know, one of them, uh, gloating time, we ought to mention just briefly because we had this debate over net neutrality. Net neutrality, I mean, what does that sound like? Sounds good, neutrality's nice, we're gonna treat everybody equally. It was a government mandate and we had some great, uh, I mean, we, we did the, the commentary. I wanted to basically just remind people, look, it was gonna, the world was gonna end, the internet was gonna be disastrously unable, you know, we wouldn't be able to use it, only powerful interests could. Instead, more people using it, faster speeds. Uh, obviously, this was a success. And interestingly, we had uh, two comments that are worth uh, pointing out. One by Daniel McKernan, where he really pointed out this was not, big tech taking over as much as the government taking over and getting its nose in the tent. Once the government could kind of decide who deserves to have what, you know, Katie barred the door, bad things are going to happen. And, uh, and I think he's right on the mark. Uh, and then we also got uh, Thomas Knapp, who has been, uh, has been disagreeing on a lot of things to say this was a great commentary but to disagree on one item of it, which was that we referred to the people behind net neutrality uh, as left. And he argues that they're more appropriately should be seen as statist or even conservative. And he also argued that libertarians are on the far left of the spectrum. Uh, I don't know what spectrum he's using exactly. And you can use different ones. You can get to different places. Uh, but I just wanted to say this, which is, I endeavor to use the language, the labels that I think most people recognize. And if there's an important reason to somehow redefine something, uh, well then, okay, if uh, I'm, I'm more than willing to say, no, that's not the right word, we should use this. But we run into these sometimes about left and right and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, I liberal, uh, used to be liberal was a classical liberal, which is a libertarian, you know, pretty much the same thing. And, uh, and so, you know, we had that over liberal, but I think at a certain point, you just have to go with what people understand and try to communicate to the most people. And I think that um, we're not going to win because we defined everything right. Uh, and, and one of the places I go to again and again is people who will tell me that 
we're not a democracy, Paul, we're a republic. And of course, they're 100% right. And if you think about it, democracy, as at least some folks understand it, is we're going to vote on everything. We could vote on whether we're enslaved tomorrow. And if enough people vote for it, then we're going to be enslaved or thrown in the, into the volcano or who knows what terrible thing. Well, my experience from talking to people all over the world who talk about democracy, nobody's talking about that form of pure democracy. Nobody, anywhere, in any language. They're talking about a system in which we have voting and we have democratic checks and democratic processes to, to empeople imp government, to put people into government to make decisions. And we protect human rights. And of course, there are gonna be debates from time to time about what is a human right? Is it uh, family leave? Is that a human right? Or is freedom of speech a human right? Um, and you know, so there's gonna be those, those disagreements. But I find that to be a not helpful argument to have for the most part about the word democracy. Most people don't intend it as pure democracy. When I say democracy to a big crowd, I have one or two people who might see it as that, oh, we're gonna vote on everything. And I think what it, what it does for libertarians and some conservatives is to cause them to not notice the fact that when people are in control of their government, when they go to the polls and vote, they're voting for policies oftentimes, most often, that I think conservatives and libertarians are gonna like. I think that, that voters do better at the ballot box on issues than they do on candidates because they're not given the kind of good choices on candidates that they ought to be given. And I look at a place like Hong Kong where we just had an election where they vote for the first time where pro-democracy candidates are running for these local councils and the pro-democracy candidates go from never having run before to 90% of the seats. And, and you can't say, oh, 90%, they must have, must have been a fraudulent election. No, their opponents ran the election. So we know that if they were gonna cheat, they were gonna cheat, they maybe got 95%. Um, so democracy is a wonderful tool, as far as I'm concerned, a wonderful mechanism to better allow citizens to control their government. Not perfect, people make mistakes, but there's, you know, if, if the idea is we need some experts to do it, um, or that, you know, somehow we have to have arms linked from the, the regular people, that's our, that's our hope. I think, I think if you had average Americans everywhere making decisions, we're gonna make much, much better decisions than if you have that bunch in Congress making all the decisions. Um, that's a recipe for disaster. Thank you for tuning in to This Week in Common Sense, which can be seen each weekend on thisiscommonsense.com and on YouTube, and listened to as an audio podcast on SoundCloud and Stitcher.